was a Bitcoin. Yeah. Bitcoiners, I just got off with two people that are pushing forward Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and the sovereign individual agenda in Panama. Literally, the guy who wrote the bill for the cryptocurrency bill in Panama that is currently being circulated is a huge fan of my favorite book, The Sovereign Individual, and he is pushing for that agenda in Panama. He's actually trying to perpetuate the thesis of the book in his country, and it's amazing to see uh, and learn that Panama is such a commerce, capitalism, freedom forward place. Um, that was a, a new learning for me. So these gentlemen are trying to make Panama a internet friendly place, a place that plugs into the future and plugs into the internet. And you know, while this is not a Bitcoin maximalist bill, they explain that Panama can't really even have a sole legal tender, which is something super unique about the country. Uh, I think you all are going to really enjoy this conversation. Uh, and yeah, let's just get right into it. Learn a little bit about what is happening with legalization and acceptance of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in Panama. <laughs> Welcome back to the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. I am sitting across from two gentlemen who are involved in making moves for Bitcoin and crypto in Panama. I'm sitting across from Congressman Gabriel Silva and tech entrepreneur Felipe Enchandi. Um, welcome both to the podcast. Did I get your name right, Felipe? I'm sorry. Close enough. Don't worry. Awesome. Enchandi. Well, so hey. Well, welcome both to the podcast. So, um, Felipe, you were part of writing the this the draft for this bill, and then Gabriel, you were kind of the congressman pushing this forward. I'm kind of interested, you know, give us give us the backdrop of you know what is happening in Panama, and then the story behind how you two started working together. Let's start with you, Gabriel. Yeah, thank thank you for the invite. It's uh, it's uh, really pleasure to share with you and your audience what's going on in Panama and how we're pushing for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and crypto assets and blockchain technology here in Panama. So the history of Panama has been a history of providing services to the world. Like we have Panama Canal, maybe some people have heard about that, that has changed the world's commerce. We have the second largest duty-free zone in the world. The first one is Hong Kong, then comes Panama, then the city of Colón. Uh, we have uh, a very strong and, and, and good law that attracts multinational headquarters to Panama. So we have, for example, Under Armour, Procter & Gamble, uh, Dell Computers. They have multinational headquarters here in Panama. Um, we have a lot of ports. So it has been a, a country that has focused its, its, its industry, its development to services and to connecting the world. Nevertheless, what Felipe, myself, and others have noticed is that we keep as a country betting or, or, or pushing these sectors, these industrial sectors, but we're not thinking enough about new sectors, innovating, technology, digital economy, and so forth. So um, taking this in consideration, uh, we saw what happened in El Salvador some months ago when the, the, the Congress approved the Bitcoin law in El Salvador. And that in a certain way inspired me, inspired many people across the globe. And we realized that, well, they took the first step and that in a certain way pressures, pressured us to, to think about that, to see how we can legislate on that, regulate it, promote it, and even be better than El Salvador in the ways that we can. So that was the way that the, this idea was generated. Uh, thinking of the history of Panama, the country that we ought to be if we want to continue providing services to the world, and for me, that's been in the forefront of technology, innovation, and that definitely includes cryptocurrencies. We saw what happened in El Salvador. That pushed us to, uh, to put this bill in Congress. And we've worked for it like about uh, three months, three, three months almost. And it was a very interesting drafting process because we had a lot of support from the local community. We set up Telegram uh, group chats. We set up emails, WhatsApp and numbers. Web pages where people could just throw their ideas, their suggestions. 
we set up a volunteer group. I set up a volunteer group of about 12 people, engineers, lawyers, uh, everything, uh, activists to, to build the law. And it was presented in Congress just uh, about two months ago. I knew Felipe from way back, uh, from, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, about 10 years, maybe, Felipe. And we met, um, we met, uh, I think I got to meet Felipe a little bit uh, better uh, since we were part of this group called Global Shapers. Uh, it's a group from uh, the World Economic Forum, and they basically get people that are 20 to 30 years old that are causing some impact in their countries. And they put them together, organize them, and then help them create better projects for their community. So that's how I met Felipe. And when I met Felipe, he was actually working in cryptocurrency. Uh, I think you were working in some company or some startup that was working with cryptocurrency. So he was the guy in Panama that you had to talk. If uh, and was was always preaching and talking about Bitcoin. And I remember teasing him back then about Bitcoin, and because he was like the Bitcoin master, he knew everything about it, and it was such a, a new thing here. And well, and it was still cheaper. Yeah, you didn't buy yeah. it. No, that was when it was like I don't know a thousand dollars or something. And look at us now, you know, after ten years now, uh, things got serious, and uh, I am now in Parliament in Congress, and and Felipe helped me lead the team that drafted this law. So that's a little bit of the story and background of how this happened to be. Felipe, I want to get your story of you know how did you become the Bitcoin guy in Panama, and then um, you know maybe we can start talking about the bill itself. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm, I am actually regional. I was born in Costa Rica. I'm a Panamanian citizen as well. And my mother is actually Nicaraguan. And she had to flee Nicaragua during the 80s <clears throat> because that's what happens in Latin America. You know, a country blows up and you have to flee it if you can. And depending on the side you're in. And uh, it's a very unstable life uh, for many people. Uh, people from Venezuela, for example, are facing that in this moment. Um, people in Colombia have faced it, this before, given the internal turmoil and civil war they've had. Um, and that is something that just unfortunately happens in this part of the world. So when I discovered Bitcoin many years ago, it blew my mind the potential that it had to give people new avenues to self-ownership of the product of their labor. And in, just in general, be sovereign individuals. I saw you picked up a book uh, back there. <laughs> Uh, which is one of my favorite books, actually. And um, it it just has blown my mind that the potential of Bitcoin and the ideas contained in part in that book, um, I believe are going to open the eyes of people in very different parts of the world to try to find solutions to social problems in a way that aligns incentives with people that produce value digitally. As you know, and I mean, you have several copies there, uh, the whole point is digital value creation is taking precedence over physical value creation. So you cannot treat individuals in the same way as governments, cannot treat individuals in the same way as we've done before. And in Panama, we've been heavily reliant on physical value creation. Our geographical position has been always privileged. We have the canal. We have been sort of like a physical in real life meat space hub. and the issue now is how can we bolster that position by becoming a place that's open to the digital value world, to the metaverse that's being built, to you know, to to crypto and 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 and, and this whole new way of, of creating value online. So this uh, bill, the vision that we set up, is to uh, transform Panama into something that looks more like a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, we believe countries that are going to survive are the ones that are actually going to provide services to the people that live within their, their, their borders, uh, not just countries that have always been, uh, you know, the, the tax collectors within, within these borders. Um, so the vision is, we believe crypto can not only help people move, move value, preserve the value of their labor, but also can allow new forms of governance, new forms of establishing trust among people. And uh, we uh, set up not only to make Panama compatible with Bitcoin, like what El Salvador did in their own way, but rather to make Panama an open place to create these new sorts of governance and this new sort of, 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 of way of, of, of establishing trust among individuals. Okay, so um, El Salvador, Bitcoin legal tender, Bitcoin only, 
strong focus on Lightning Network adoption, government wallet. What you know? What's the status of the bill in Panama, and uh, what can the people kind of expect from from the bill? It sounds like you have a uh, your team has a very different vision. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, the bill that we presented in Congress, it's a bit different in many aspects to the bill that was approved in, in Salvador. Just to name a few, uh, our bill is, I think, it's not only about cryptocurrency, it's not only about one cryptocurrency, it's about crypto assets in general, it's about implementing blockchain technology in the government to make it more transparent, to make it more efficient, and it's also about attracting corporations and international startups and foster local startups that want to work in the digital economy sector, in the blockchain sector, in the cryptocurrency and crypto, actor, uh, crypto asset sector. So when you see that the bill in, in El Salvador, uh, which I'm not judging or criticizing, it's much more shorter. It's about one, one coin and the government is more directly involved. They set up a wallet, they set up a fund and they made the coin uh, in a certain way mandatory. What we're doing in Panama, it's a bit different. And for several reasons, one of them is that in Panama, there can't be, by constitution, it can't be one single coin or we can't force the use of one single coin. So we can't tell Panamanians like tomorrow we will only use the US dollar or we will only use the euro. There can't be one, one only coin. And that's, that's I think, a positive thing. So that means that the country can adopt as many coins as they want. So the first thing when we were drafting this bill and saw the one in Salvador is that our constitution wouldn't, does not permit us to put in a, in a bill and that there's only going to be one cryptocurrency. So, so no legal, no legal tender in El Salvador, and sorry, in uh, Panama, I guess. Like how, do, how does legal tender work there? I'm, I'm assuming, you know, Panama, you have your own currency. We so use the US really. dollars. We use no. the US yes. dollars okay. like El Salvador, actually. Very similar to El Salvador in that way. We use the US dollars. But uh, we can we can change that anytime, and we and we can't use only one coin according to our constitution. One one bill, one tender. So to work further there, Gabriel. Actually, yeah. uh, we've never had a central bank in mm -hmm. the nation's history. Panama was created as a country and never had a central bank. Has never had legal tender in the sense that it is forcibly imposed on people. We do have legal tender in the sense of collecting taxes. So the government has to choose what they will use to collect taxes, that's in the fiscal code, but the constitution clearly states that there, it is prohibited to impose the acceptance of a particular currency okay. on individuals and businesses. Therefore, our solution was, well, we can't do what El Salvador did, and we actually think it might be a good idea to not do it. In Panama already, you can go, despite that we use the US dollar mostly in day-to-day -day transactions, you can go to banks and open accounts in Swiss francs, in Euro, in Yen, that's that's something that's possible here and we don't have a we don't have capital controls we don't have a central bank el salvador does have a central bank even though they're dollarized so we mm -hmm. have a very specific historical uh, you know backdrop that i think makes us um suited to to just be open just be open and accept whatever people and individuals accept and 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 uh, that includes all of crypto assets and the market will decide which are the good ones and which are not yeah, so the first big difference is that the, the project recognizes the use of cryptocurrency as a medium of pain and getting paid. And that's important because it provides the legal certainty, the legal backdrop, the legal structure, and recognizes the use of cryptocurrencies as a medium of exchange. We don't mean, we, as different, as different from, from El Salvador, we don't mention one. It's not only Bitcoin, it's any cryptocurrencies can be used. So that's the first thing that is important on the project is recognizing the use of cryptocurrency, any cryptocurrency as a medium of exchange. Maybe we would have liked and we discussed putting only Bitcoin, but as we mentioned, our constitution does not permit us to do that. Second thing that's important is the use of blockchain technology in the government. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the intention of this is that with this law, we'll, we are including in the digital agenda of the government, the government has a digital agenda with with plans to all of the institutions and ministries and agencies, we're including in that digital agenda, uh, the use of blockchain technology in the different government agencies. And we think that's positive and, and Felipe might expand on, on what would that specifically translate to, but because it will be positive because it will help us save money, have more efficient processes, 
more transparency and more citizen participation. Um, so that's a very important project, uh, part of the project. And the third most important part of the project, I would say, uh, what I already mentioned, the part of attracting, creating a license so that companies, startups, entrepreneurs from all over the world come to Panama, are attracted by our country, its location, its weather, the, and, and come here and, and foster and create their own startups uh, that are focused on digital economy, cryptocurrency, and crypto assets. We want big companies and small companies and entrepreneurs to come here and foster the creation and the growth of cryptocurrencies in Panama and in the world. So those are the main three things about this project, which, I, as I mentioned, they differ from El Salvador, which is only one bill, small bill, 12 articles, big points that it's, it's recognized, it's mandatory, and that's it. This project is a little bit broader, bigger, and I think it has a, a, a more ample, or ample uh, and bigger vision of, of what technology should be in Panama. <laughs>I want to tell you about our newest sponsor. This show is brought to you by Ledin.io. I have been super, super impressed with the guys over at Ledin. I've actually known the co-founders, Adam and Mauricio, for a very long time. I've had the pleasure to watch them build Ledin up from a tiny, tiny startup to now a super impressive institutional grade Bitcoin and crypto lender. Y'all, I'm so impressed with these guys. They are offering some of the best rates out there. I don't think anyone even comes close to touching them. You can get 6.1% APY on your first two Bitcoin that you deposit into Ledin interest accounts, and you can get 8.5% US on USDC deposits. I mean, I know all the competitors. They're not even close. If you're going to put your crypto and your Bitcoin into an interest account, Ledin is by far the best. And on top of that, like I said, these guys are hardcore Bitcoiners and they know the products and the services that Bitcoiners want and appreciate. They come up with B2X. It allows you to put your Bitcoin in, they leverage it up, and you can, with one click of the mouse, get twice the exposure to Bitcoin. So if you're super bullish, Ledin has you covered with a super, super easy way to get leverage with B2X. And then on top of that, they know that Bitcoiners care about your reserves. They know that Bitcoiners don't like under-reserved and not full-reserved financial institutions. So they are pushing the frontier in transparency in the digital asset lending space. And they are the first digital asset lender to do a full proof of reserves and proof of attestation through a Mariano LLC, a public accounting firm. So the letting guys, they know what Bitcoin is like. They are legit. I encourage you guys to check them out. Do your own research and go to ledin.io, that is L-E-D-N.io, and learn more. Bitcoiners, I want to tell you about The Deep Dive. The Deep Dive is Bitcoin Magazine's premium market intelligence newsletter. This is a no-fluff, hard-hitting, incredible newsletter going deep into the market, helping you understand what's happening with derivatives, what's happening on-chain, what's happening in macro, what's happening with the narrative, and what's happening with the tech. My man Dylan LeClaire is an absolute savant. He is making his name known in the Bitcoin community, getting shout outs left and right, getting on podcasts left and right. And him and his team are bringing you everything that you need to know about Bitcoin. You don't even have to be on Bitcoin Twitter. You can ignore every other newsletter. This is the newsletter to rule them all. Go over to members.bitcoinmagazine.com. Sign up today. And if you use promo code MACRO, you get a full month for free. You have nothing to lose. What are you waiting for? Sign up, see the incredible work that Dylan and his team are putting out. And if you don't like it, just unsubscribe. You don't pay a dime. But if you do, you know, it's going to be well worth the sats in investment in understanding Bitcoin and gaining the confidence to continue to invest in Bitcoin and making the right moves around Bitcoin. And it's going to be well worth every single Satoshi. Uh, again, can't recommend it enough. That is members.bitcoinmagazine.com, promo code MACRO. Do it today. So there's a lot to tease out here. I'm sure Felipe wants to jump in with uh, some clarifications, but just really quickly uh, on you know recognizing all crypto as a medium of exchange, what does that do to like the tax liability around you know, capital gains and stuff like that. It already sounds like, you know, you know, Panama is a very trade free kind of environment as it is, but can you just talk about maybe like 
granted this passes, you know, what does that look like for someone who's sitting on massive dollar denominated gains in the cryptocurrency and yet is using it um, as a medium of exchange and as money? Certainly. Um, so the whole backdrop in, in the, in, of, of, the, of the bill is certainty. Certainty and in a competitive way. So to answer your question, not only crypto assets are recognized as a medium of exchange if people decide to accept them. So it's voluntary acceptance of medium of exchange of any cryptocurrency or crypto asset. Um, in second place, uh, certainty in tax rules. In Panama, we have something that is called a territorial tax system. In contrast to the US, uh, people are taxed based on where the asset is located. So if you have an asset that is located in Panama, for example, um, you know, uh, stock in a private company in Panama, that is a asset that is invested in Panama. That asset is subject to either capital gains or sales tax regimes, depending on the type of asset. Um, so in this case, um, most of crypto assets actually are not invested economically anywhere. They are in the internet. So what we've attempted to do in the bill is to make compatible Panama's territorial tax system in a way that recognizes that internet-based value is not Panama tax income. So basically, in summary, you would not pay any capital gains over any crypto assets that do not have an underlying value that's invested economically in Panama. So if you tokenize your house in Panama and you sell it to a third party, you will pay capital gains on that token because it's essentially selling your house as if you were selling an actual piece of land in Panama. Um, we actually pick a differentiated capital gains uh, uh, rate, uh, it's 4%, which is way lower than most of the world, frankly. Um, but most of crypto assets, if they don't have an underlying value that's basically invested in the Republic, which is most of internet value creation, you that would be considered foreign source income. So the whole point here is to make it attractive for individuals to become Panamanian tax residents. Come here, live here, build the future from our jungles, from our beaches, uh, and, uh, you know, pay very little taxes, but at the same time, spend here, live here, and get to know people here, which is what we want. Transfer that knowledge to Panamanians that are starting to pick uh, up what they're going to do in their, in their life as they leave you know, school or whatever. Um, so what we are trying to achieve is to make it attractive to come here and innovate from Panama. And in addition to tax, another part of certainty that we've, we've been very careful to to, to is what is custody of crypto assets? Um, we've seen in the US and we've been following really closely the discussion on the infrastructure bill and more recently the discussions on the SEC that um, uh, the, uh, the chairman of the SEC is suggesting that most crypto assets apparently are securities, which you know that, 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 that is frankly nerve wracking. Um, and we believe that in here we can give way better certainty for innovators to uh, to, to, to know the rules that apply to them. So specifically, on the custody side, a person that participates in a multi-sig transaction or an NLOC transaction is not considered a custodian. If you create a smart contract like SushiSwap, Uniswap, et cetera, you are not custodying crypto assets. That does not trigger any type of licensing. The whole DeFi space would is basically peer-to-peer. -peer. It's smart contracts. It's something that is not really, does not entail necessarily the custody of crypto assets. The only place that a license will be required is if an individual is actually fully trusting another person to custody their assets. And that means a full custodial system, like what Coinbase does, for example, and some other, some other solutions. So what we want it to be is really, really open. And for that, we actually followed uh, Coin Center's definition on custody. And also we included some of the exemptions proposed by uh, Wyden and Loomis in the US to make it clear that we don't want to bring everyone in the fold of, of licensing. For example, NFTs, um, you know, regulating a digital art gallery as a bank would be just a category error. That would just be zero compatible with, with internet value creation. So, um, that type of certainty is what we work really hard to create. And, and hopefully um, when this becomes law, um, we will have a ton of people come here and, you know, become Panamanian residents and, and, and build really cool things from here.
Uh, I love that. I mean, it's clear that you are a fan of the sovereign individual. Obviously, I am a fan of the sovereign individual. I think it's the most important book that someone can read today. Um, I think it'll it'll really it's been prescient and it uh, and it, I think will guide you to make smart decisions into the future. And the principles of the sovereign individual is that internet value creation will unlock the doors for jurisdictional arbitrage like we've never seen it, right? And when I hear you two talking about the specific tax situation and specific uh, legal tender situation and things like that in Panama and the, uh, you know, the geographic uh, benefits as well and uh, all, the, all the things you're talking about Panama as, uh, you know, reasons for people to come to Panama and reasons why Panama is going to effectively compete directly with every other country for talent um, and capital, it really just shows that the book was completely spot on. So um, it's kind of uh, amazing that, you know, someone who re is reading the book is kind of like actually making it kind of come true um, in a jurisdiction uh, that, that, you know, this already is something that make it makes sense for. Um, but I just, you know, that observation to me was pretty mind blowing. No, I, I completely agree. And, and, and the whole point here is the name of the bill is actually crypto law, but the longer title is a bill that makes the Republic of Panama compatible with the internet. That's what we want to achieve. That's the end goal. Crypto is just the latest incarnation of the internet. It is the native money to the internet. So if we want to completely merge into the internet, which is the forefront of humanity right now in almost every aspect, we need to be compatible with that. That's why the bill had to be longer and more uh, complex than just establishing a currency as legal tender. It's a compatibility bill. We are basically creating standards to plug Panama into the internet API of sorts so, pe so people can actually live here and build the future of mankind from, from here. So... Um... I love a lot of the things you're saying. I love that, um, you know, you two, you know, are open to making Panama more competitive for talent globally. I think that's really important. There's something like Bitcoin Magazine is a Bitcoin kind of focused periodical for me. You know, I, I like to observe the entire crypto sphere. I uh, really like I'm very interested in what's happening across a lot of different coins and uh, the smart contract space. But my base case is like Bitcoin is still the the alpha omega and what is actually shaping this revolution so when i hear things like you know we want to add blockchain technology to the government i'm like eh, like what kind of blockchain how's the service distributed like you know what's hosting it is it on ethereum like what is this you know what is adding the blockchain to, to the government like that doesn't make sense to me um yeah i mean uh, everything else kind of makes sense to me, but that's what, like one of the big things that just like that, you know, it kind of jumped out as, as a, as a red flag I, to I, me I, just because I, I don't get it. I just don't get it. It's not the blockchain. It's not Bitcoin. It's the blockchain. That's what some people say. Right. Uh, and that, that's not the, that's not the ethos at all. Um, the, the issue is we're so behind in so many other aspects, really basic things that you take for granted in the U S and Panama are just not possible. And what we believe is we will drive way more adoption of Bitcoin and other crypto assets as payment methods if people learn to use them for every sort of action in their day-to-day -day life. If they're, for example, right here in Panama, we have a national ID card. That's something that exists many years ago. So we don't have that debate on whether you know having ID cards or not, like in the US, it's already a fact. Let's have ID cards that are compatible with the internet so we can have something like what Estonia did, where we become providers of digital identity for anyone in the world to do even more traditional things. Not everyone has to, um, you know, it doesn't have to be, uh, uh, you know, it, it's not crypto only. It's a way to establish trust among, among people. But I completely understand what you say. And, and, and frankly, I am also, I am not, I guess, a Bitcoin maximalist, but I think Bitcoin is just the project that has the most clout and the most history and i'm actually very excited of some some solutions that even are exploring you know smart contracts on top of bitcoin and some other things that might uh not be huge yet but that might be very big or lightning itself um so rather than imposing a specific technology what we want to do is again make panama compatible with the internet 
whatever that entails. One point, for example, we have in the, in the bill is to make internet access universally accessible. That is something that may sound crazy, but in our part of the world, uh, that makes all the difference for a little kid that's in the middle of the, you know, of, of rural Panama. That person can access Wikipedia with the internet and can read about Bitcoin and these, and these things or find a sovereign individual or a translation into Spanish or whatever. Uh, whereas a person without the internet is literally stuck with their school teacher uh, that probably has no idea about these things. So this goes beyond just payments and, 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 and crypto assets. It's, it's, it's more of a what type of country we wanna be and what type of culture we want to have. And uh, that's why we try to be really, really open. Uh, but I, I hear you, I think Bitcoin is an extremely exciting project and uh, hopefully we'll see more adoption here. So Gabriel, I wanna go back to you and I'm kind of curious like, you know, what, what are your key motivations here? And like, I guess, what, what do you see this doing to Panama? And I guess we can go from there. Sure. Um, so I'm a politician and my job is to take care of the people here in Panama and to help them have better lives, uh, more fulfilling lives and have better public services. That's the people that those, the people are my clients, so that's the people I want to help, the people in my country. And uh, I think this bill is very positive for them for several reasons. I think number one is the possibility of creating new jobs, just attracting companies from abroad that want to come to Panama, establishes their offices here in the beaches, in the rainforests, in the city, or fostering entrepreneurs and, and companies here in Panama that provide value and that work in the digital economy, that just helps by providing jobs to the people here in Panama. Very interesting that when studying this project, we came about a, a very interesting case the, of Singapore, where more people work in the digital economy sector than in the traditional banking sector. So Panama has always been compared to Singapore. It's been called the Singapore of Latin America, this and that. And I think this is something very important we should be focusing because in the end of the, of the day, uh, it's, it's important for me and for the Panamanian people because it has the potential to create hundreds and thousands of jobs for the, for the population. That's, that's the main motivation for me. I think the second motivation, it's, um, it's just that what Felipe mentioned and broadly speaking is by attracting foreign talent, by attracting people who know about this, who have studied this, who worked on this, and just getting them here and creating that ecosystem in Panama of foreign talents and make them share with the community, create, a, create groups here, that is very valuable for the country. You know, it's just having people that are talented, that are intelligent, that are thinking uh, about the forefront and the development of technology and innovation of the world, just having them here is very positive for the country. Not only because maybe when they buy something at the store that represents taxes they have to pay, uh, but also because they will share with the local community and they will help them grow and provide and the, it's a leak of knowledge. So I think that's the second motivation about this project, bringing people here that can share the community and can help uh, make Panama a better place. Just having these people here, share with Congress people, share with the politicians, share with the, with the regular Panamanian who help our country be a, 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 a better place, an innovative place. So th I think those are my two main motivations as a politician, jobs for the people and also uh, the potential of attracting people here and creating a bigger community and exploring more ideas and, and not getting stuck in the traditional history of Panama, which we already mentioned of the same traditional uh, services and, and sectors and industry, but being at the front front and development of technology and innovation. I think that will be a game changer in our future. It will help us grow in GDP, in employment, reduce our poverty rates, help foster better education, achieve better education, as Felipe mentioned, just with this bill, by giving access to internet to the entire population or, or most of the population, it's access to education, it's access to jobs, it's access to knowledge. And, and we are a country where there are twice the number of cell phones. In, 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 when we consider the amount of population, we have 4 million people here in Panama, but there are 8, 8 million, 9 million cell phones with internet access. Nevertheless, we still have about 20, 25% of the population that do not have access to internet. And we're trying to reach that population uh, to help them grow, have better lives. That is my, my motivation behind the bill. We have a storm here, as you heard. 
tropical weather. <laughs> Bitcoiners, let's take a break from the content and I want to tell you about Coolbix. Coolbix is an awesome Bitcoin hardware wallet that has been around for a really long time. They are building an amazing Bitcoin wallet called the Cool Wallet Pro. The Cool Wallet Pro is state of the art Bitcoin hardware wallet technology. Its form factor is like a credit card. You can put it into your wallet and it is designed to go with you on the go. So that way, even when you're on the go, you can have the benefit of a two-factor uh, hardware wallet design when you're trying to spend your Bitcoin. So you can have your Bitcoin uh, wallet uh, UX on your phone and make it really easy to scan, decide what you want to do. But then you sign with a cool bit X, which is in your back pocket. It is tamper proof. It is waterproof. It is flexible. It has an awesome secure element in it. And it is a really awesome way in order to have some more flexibility, yet security when you're taking your Bitcoin on the go. I personally am a fan of, you know, this idea of making Bitcoin into a medium of exchange and making it into something that people use. I know it's going to take time, but they are working on the UX for making that possible in as secure a way possible. So uh, have some peace of mind. Check out the Cool Wallet Pro from Cool Bix. Uh, and yeah, thank you to them for sponsoring this podcast. Bitcoiners, I am so excited to tell you about the Bitcoin 2022 conference. You guys, Bitcoin 2021 was absolutely a smash hit success. It was over 13,000 Bitcoiners coming together, breaking the barriers on who can come together and celebrate freedom, celebrate Bitcoin, and the energy was absolutely electric. Unfortunately, it was just oversubscribed. There's just people flowing out everywhere. And this year we are learning, we are making the conference bigger and better. We are moving over to the Miami Beach Convention Center, and we are going to be throwing a massive four-day festival for Bitcoin, celebrating Bitcoin, bringing together the greatest minds in Bitcoin and the greatest businesses in Bitcoin. And lastly, the culture of Bitcoin all together. We have a four-day extravaganza planned for you guys for Bitcoin 2022. Uh, day one is going to be industry day. It is a day where you can buy a special ticket in order to uh, just mingle and make business deals happen. Day two and three is going to be a full-blown Bitcoin conference. This is our main conference. This is going to be on April 7th and 8th. And then lastly, we have the Sound Music Festival day four. Imagine going to Coachella. But for Bitcoin, there's going to be very few talks. It's going to be all about the culture of Bitcoin. It's going to be all about hanging with your fellow plebs. It is going to be an absolutely amazing time. There's going to be Bitcoin musicians, Bitcoin artists, and all your favorite Bitcoiners and just an amazing environment to party and just see it all, soak it all in, and to get people to realize that a Bitcoin world, a world filled with Bitcoin people doing Bitcoin things is the world that they want to live in. That's what Bitcoin 2022 is all about. That is what the Bitcoin conference is all about. That's what Bitcoin magazine is all about. So it is going to be a celebration of Bitcoin, the Bitcoiners, and this amazing movement that is going to make the world a better place. Go to b.tc forward slash conference. Learn more about the Bitcoin conference. Learn more about all the amazing things that are happening in Miami around the Bitcoin conference and buy your tickets. And guess what? If you buy your bit tickets with Bitcoin, you save $100 on all the tickets and $1,000 on the whale pass. So if you want the VIP pass, the, the big kahuna, if you buy with Bitcoin, you save $1,000. That's a lot of sats. So go and do it right now today. Don't wait. Prices are only going up. This is going to be a can't miss event. <laughs> Uh, I want to learn a little bit more about um, what's the status on the bill and what uh, and do you expect uh, the bill to pass? And if it does get passed, you know, what does implementation kind of look like? Sure. And one thing uh, additionally, I would say just providing people with the liberty of choosing how they want to invest their money and how they want to transfer their money and how they want to buy and sell their things. So it's interesting because Panama, uh, unfortunately, more than half of the population does not have a bank account. And when you don't have a bank account today, you don't have access to credit, you don't have access to, to, to have a, a credit card, a debit card, to pay things. And it's, it's essential today if you wanna get a better education, get a job or, or build a, a small company. 
nevertheless, more than 50% of the population does not have a, a bank account. And I think that by providing and allowing and giving legal certainty to cryptocurrencies to like Bitcoin and others, that helps people transfer money, buy things, receive things easier, uh, cheaper than if they had to depend on the traditional banking institutions uh, here in Panama or any place, other place in the world. So we presented the bill about two weeks ago, and uh, the, the presentation was very successful in the in. in in a way, because we, we it was co-sponsored by many members of parliament from all the different political parties, uh, so it's not one one member of parliament, one congressman pushing the bill forward. Uh, many members of parliament from all across the different uh, political parties signed it, and that's very valuable because it shows that it's it's not carried by one politician, but it's uh, hopefully a, a project that carries the Panama flag, not of one political party or one politician. This, and we, we have talked already with many government, high-ranking government officials from the different ministries and agencies that have to do with this, with, with this bill. We have upcoming meetings in the next weeks with several of these government agencies to explain the project to them. They have, they show interest in it. They want to better understand it. So I, I feel I have a sensing of, of very of a lot of optimism and, and curiosity uh, from the presidency of Panama uh, and below about this bill. They have seen the attention that it has, it has brought in Panama um, from the local community and international community. So very, they're very, very curious and excited about building up on this bill. Um, it's very difficult to say how long it will take to make it a, a law to, so that it is approved a law. It's very different from El Salvador. Our internal politics, it's a little bit different. You know, there's one party in Salvador who as the presidency and who also has parliament, so they can get stuff easier and, and, and faster approved. Uh, our, our democracy is a little bit more uh, messy in, in a positive way, maybe, uh, and, and diverse. Nevertheless, as I mentioned, there's a strong community in Panama that wants this project to become law and they're pushing for it. And there's curiosity from all types of political parties and, and, and the government. So I think it, it has a positive future, positive outlook. Uh, I would also mention that the bill, as it has presented, and I want to repeat this, uh, and I have been repeating it several times, it's not set in stone. It, it has the opportunity to grow, to change, to modify things, to make it even better. And we have set up uh, so many different channels of communication with the, with the citizens so that they can, they can send us their suggestions, their questions, their, their, their doubts, whatever. That they have so that they can also participate in building and, and creating this project. It's not set in stone. It's still a project that can be improved and should be improved because we know that the, it's not perfect, but it, it can. we want to get it as close as perfect as we can. One, one thing I would add is um, we translated the project, the bill in English, um, and it's it's actually, I don't know if you're going to have show notes uh, and, and you can add the text, but any legal geeks out there that want to help us improve it even further, we'd love your help. We want to make this as compatible with as many type of initiatives as we can. Um, and we're open to, you know, improving on the definitions and texts and, and, and all of that. And I'm sure uh, this audience has a great diverse set of people that, that, that actually are pretty knowledgeable about this. So, um, it would be amazing to, to get that type of feedback, uh, not only from people in Panama, but uh, people abroad. I believe it's embedded in a Bitcoin magazine article. So I'll, yes. I'll put that into the show notes. Yes. Awesome. Um, so lastly, you know, before we close out the show, I want you each to take a turn at like describing what life in Panama is like, you know, maybe there's some Bitcoiners listening to this. They're saying, Hey, if this bill passes, Panama could be a good spot for me. You know, talk about Panama, talk about the food, talk about the geography, you know, talk about the weather, all that stuff. Uh, let's start with you, Felipe. Sure. Well, um, one super cool thing about Panama is that you have people from everywhere. When we have the World Cup and there is um, a game from Italy, you hear in the city the Italians screaming for their team. And these are Panamanian Italians. And then the Greeks, the same. And then the Spanish, the same. Um, we have great Indian food. We have great Caribbean food. It's a real melting pot of, of, of cultures because of the position we're in. 
Um, we have a large history of, 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 of Caribbean influence. So you get the best, you know, beef jerky, you get the best, I mean, the food is really, really, really great. Um, also, um, you can in the same day go from one ocean to the other. Uh, so you can be in the Pacific Ocean and in the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean in the same day. And there's actually a way to see them from a mountain that you can hike from the same vantage point, see both oceans. That's something that it's not possible to do in most places. Um, we're also starting to see a ton of great communities emerge in different parts of the, of the country. Uh, there's a great place called Venao Pedasi, which is a sort of alternative, um, sort of ecologically, but internet connected solar punk community or so. Uh, you also have a more sort of, um, withdrawn community in, 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 in the other part of the, of the Azuero Peninsula. That's called Torio. You can go and surf every day from your house and pay like $200 in rent, which is amazing with a good internet connection uh, and living from the internet, you can actually uh, you know, have a great life here. So um, we have the best coffee in the world. Uh, Geisha coffee is the coffee that uh, sells for more than $1,200 a pound when it's sold in auction. And you can buy it directly from the roaster and the grower. Um, and there's a ton of really crazy experiments happening there around fermenting coffee and using beer, uh, yeast to ferment coffee and do a lot of crazy stuff. Um, so, you know, that, those are some of the examples of what's happening here. We think we can uh, really become a hotbed of new ideas, uh, refreshing ideas in every sort of way uh, by coming from a frankly fucked up region, like Latin America is messed up. Um, so we have a really close uh, vision of the problems that most of humanity is facing. Uh, maybe in developed countries, you don't really see that. So bringing really smart people to come and use the cutting edge of human knowledge to try to solve really basic issues for many people in a, in a place that's open to solving those issues is, is I think, a pretty cool experience to live in. And uh, at least I enjoy it quite a bit. Yeah, I think that's a really cool question. Thank you for asking it. Um, Panama, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to describe it because it's a country that I think changes by the day or by the year. So if you come to Panama 10 years ago, it would, it would have been super different from what it is today. And I think that it's improving. Every year it's improving. It's becoming a, a bigger country, a bigger city with more people from abroad, with more, more community, with more places to go, to hang out, to eat, to, to drink. Like, it's uh it's it's a country that's growing it's not stuck like if you go to some other countries i don't want to mention any names but if you go to some other countries in latin america you would see that the countries like if you go if we went there like 10 years ago 15 years ago five years ago it's like the same place same streets same houses same same stuff but panama is constantly growing changing evolving and in a good way um it's a safe place i think that's very important like uh, compared to other countries in the region it's it's safe, um, so you can walk in the streets, you can hang out at night, you don't need like big cars and bodyguards and stuff like that. It's safe to go into an Uber and, and drive to places. Like it's, it's a safe city and it's a safe uh, country. Um, it's a place where you can get anything you want. Like uh, there's so many local pubs now, there's so many like co local coffee shops there. You can order anything from anywhere, like you could find, all of the type of food you want, all of the types of shops you want. Like it's a very uh, multicultural, diverse city where you can get anything you want in, in the city. So it's it's not like like whatever you come from in the world. If you're from the states, if you're from Germany, if you're from Central and Asia, uh, since there's so many cultures here, like you would find whatever thing, whatever you need here. Um, it's also a really cool place for do for doing like exciting tourism. Like as Felipe mentioned. We have the Caribbean, where you can go. We have the, the one of the best and several of the best uh, waves in, in Latin America and in the country. Surf competitions are always being done here in Panama. Uh, there's a very strong community growing a, a, around the surf uh, surfing spots in the Caribbean and in the Pacific. Uh, there's also a very for the people that don't like surfing but maybe like to go to like hiking and and in the mountains. And there's also a lot to explore in our in our, our rainforest. So it's a place that has everything 
has has everything for any for anyone like whatever you want whatever you need like you can find it here in panama and i think that's it's a country that is, as i mentioned it's developing it's growing it's not stuck and i think that's important awesome well gentlemen thank you so much for coming on to the podcast um i learned a lot and uh, I'm much more interested and intrigued in Panama than I was before. So I hope that uh, the listeners are the same. Uh, Want to give you both an opportunity to kind of give a last word and plug where people can learn more about the work that you're doing individually, as well as maybe the bill. Uh, let's go back to you, um, Gabriel, and then uh, close it out with Felipe. Sure. I just want to thank you for the, for the podcast, for the interview. It's been uh, amazing to share with you and your audience. Um, yeah, you can uh, reach out to me in my social media, Gabriel Silva 8, um, how do you say it? Right down, 8 uh, underscore, underscore 7. Gabriel Silva 8 underscore 7. Uh, there you can find my webpage. You can find uh, my number. You can find uh, my email. You can find the bill translated in English. You can find... All about the bill. What we have, we have a crypto portal in my webpage where you can find the bill in English, Spanish, videos, uh, infographics in English and Spanish. Everything that we have set up to explain the bill because I know it can be a little bit technical for some people. So we have tried to summarize it, synthesize it, uh, so that people can understand it. Uh, always open for feedback. If people from the community who have been thinking about this for several years have any ideas suggestions questions please please feel free to share with us we're building something that it's not only going to be for panama but it's going to be for the world we want panama to come and be at the forefront of the future of humanity and that involves everybody panamanians but also people who are not from panama so everybody's welcome to come here and to uh, share their thoughts their ideas their suggestions and make this deal a better one Cool. And uh, well, you can find me in any social media at Felchek, F-E-L-C-H-E-C-K. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, I'm helping uh, Latin American individuals become creators and live from the internet. Not only I wish my country to become a sovereign individual, but compatible country, but we're trying to build sovereign individuals down here. Um, so if you... Um, want to support that effort uh, or have curiosity, uh, follow me in, in, in social media. And as I mentioned, if you speak Spanish, uh, you can listen to my podcast at Latino Futurismo, Latino Futurism in Spanish. I'm trying to build a Joe Rogan uh, in Spanish sort of podcast. So if you are a Latin American related individual that's building something along the lines of building the future in any crazy way, uh, hit me up. I'd love to to learn about you. Um, and that's it. Super fun. Awesome. Well, thank you again, gentlemen, for coming on to the show. To all the listeners out there, make sure to follow both of these guys. I have no doubt that they'll both be back on the show at some point into the future, hopefully to celebrate this bill passing and see what happens next. Uh, but until next time, you can follow me at CK underscore snarks on Twitter. You can follow Bitcoin Magazine at BitcoinMagazine.com and at Bitcoin Magazine on Twitter and anywhere else where you find Bitcoin Magazine content or social media content. We're there. Look up Bitcoin Magazine. You can find us. Uh, five star reviews. Everyone knows the drill. Peace. Peace.